inside the platform now so once again i will test my voice if you can hear me everyone please type yes okay fantastic now so um good evening gentlemen so let's proceed now to our class okay so i will be discussing today module 15 gas turbine engines Specifically, uh, I'll be talking about inlets and compressors. Okay, so let's start. So let's start with the inlet. So these are the contents of my discussion for today about the inlet. So we will be discussing first the types of inlet. Okay, and then we will proceed to the methods of preventing FOD. FOD means foreign object damage. And finally, the last part would be inlet icing protection system. Okay? Now, what is the inlet section? So, the inlet section is actually the, uh, the, the first component of your uh, gas turbine engine wherein your air enters inside the engine. Okay? So, it is where the air enters inside the engine. And your inlet ha actually is divided into two major uh, structural parts. Mainly, the we have the intake nose. So this is the intake nose on the picture here on the right. This uh, silver uh, component here that you can see, this is the intake nose. And we have the long duct, which is on the inside, that is called the inlet duct. Okay. Now, this inlet is actually part of the airframe structure. It's not part of the engine itself okay it's part of the airframe and uh, it's actually designated as station number one okay uh, station number one now um the inlet since it is the first component wherein your air enters inside the engine the inlet is actually a, a very critical part of the engine okay uh, it will directly affect the quality of the air that enters the engine. Okay? So, for example, if your inlet, as you can see here on the picture here, okay, if your inlet has, let's say, some form of damages, such as this one, okay, or probably some form of uh, ice formation occurring here on this part, so you will see that the quality of the air flowing inside is greatly affected okay now what is the significance of this okay if the quality of the air uh, is not good when it enters the engine then um, the uh, compressor which is the next part the next major component of the engine will be greatly affected okay the the, the performance of the compressor will be greatly affected because of the quality of the air entering inside your inlet so that's why my, the point here is that it is important that this inlet section is to be, uh, to be remain uh, free from any um, damages or uh, disturbance. Okay, it should be smooth as possible and it should be clean in order for uh, uh, the air to enter smoothly and of good quality. Now let's proceed to the types of inlets. Okay. So these are the major types of inlets that are being used on different gas turbine engine configurations. Okay, so let's start with the engine mounted inlets. So when you say engine mounted inlets, so this type of inlet is the most popular. Okay, uh, when you say engine mounted, it is directly in front, mounted in front of the compressor. Okay, it's in the front of the engine and immediately after it is the compressor of the engine. Okay. Now, we also have this wing-mounted inlets or otherwise known as wing root intakes. Okay. 
Now, as you can see, that's why it's called wing root intakes. The inlet portion are positioned near the wing root. When you say the wing root, that is the portion of the wing which is nearest to the fuselage body. Okay, it's actually in the connection. It's positioned in the connection between or in the junction between the fuselage and the wings. Okay, so that is wing mounted inlets or wing root in, uh, intakes. Okay, now this type of intakes are typically used. For aircrafts that have engines which are built in inside the aft fuselage. Meaning the engine is, just like for example in this figure here, okay, the engine is over here on the aft portion of the fuselage. Okay, so the most typical design is this one. Next, we have this, what you call as the fuselage-mounted inlets. So, when you say fuselage-mounted inlets, the inlet duct is essentially part of the fuselage of the aircraft or the body of the aircraft. Okay? So, this type of inlet is commonly suited uh, when the aircraft has the engines uh, fitted inside the fuselage. Just like this airplane in the picture, as you can see, the engine is over here, near at the middle section of the airplane. So that's why the inlet is right here. It's technically part of the fuselage structure. Now, what are the advantages and disadvantages of this type of design? Now, the main advantage is you have a, a more aerodynamically clean aircraft. Okay? So why? Why do we say so? Because, as you can see, the inlet is already part of the fuselage, so you don't need any more uh, separate part to be exposed on the wind outside that will of course create drag okay so since it's a part of the fuselage already that then the design is uh one effect of it is to oh, in general to minimize the overall drag of the airplane so you have a more aerodynamic aircraft or more aerodynamically clean aircraft okay but on the other hand the main disadvantage of this type of design is that normally this inlet has a very, very long duct inside. Okay? So, just like in this picture here, the engine of this airplane is over here near the aft. So, you have a very long duct wherein the air will travel before it will actually enter the inside of the engine. So, that is uh, one disadvantage. Why? Because the longer the, the duct, the, uh, the longer the duct where the air flows, okay, the, the, the more there will be a losses on the energy of the air because of the friction. Okay. Okay, so there is a question here from one of our participants, Sir Jonathan. Thank you for asking the question. It says here, why, sir, it has a long ducting? Okay. So why it has a long ducting? Uh, thank you for that question. So it has uh, normally it has this long duct because the uh, the engine is fitted here, right here at this portion at the aft. So by by the design configuration itself, okay, uh, just like this airplane, it's not possible to have just a short duct for the inlet. Okay, because as you can see on this on this airplane here in the picture, you have a cockpit here at the front of the aircraft, and there's no other position that will best fit the engine aside from this area over here at the aft. Okay, so that's why the designers make this duct uh, have a to have a very long ducting because of the configuration or because of the position of the engine itself. So that's why. Okay, I hope that answers your question, Sir Jonathan. Please acknowledge. Okay, very well. Thank you. Now, let me proceed with the discussion. Okay, another type of inlet is this one. This is called bifurcated inlet. Okay, so when you say bifurcated inlet, the inlets are positioned here at the sides of the airplane and also near the wing root or almost at the wing root area of the aircraft. Okay. Now, um, 
this type of inlet design is also used if your engine is uh, situated at the aft of the fuselage also. Okay? But uh, there is a great disadvantage for this design. Uh, and what is that disadvantage? Uh, if ever there is a great turbulence, for example, okay, of the air, okay, then the, the quality of the air entering the engine is also affected. It will be turbulent also. It will probably be turbulent also. So therefore, it won't be good for the compressor. Okay, another thing is if the airplane is executing a severe maneuver, like for example here on the figure, the airplane is executing a severe nose left uh, turning or yawing, okay, then you can see that the air will be disrupted. There is a possibility that the air flowing on the intakes will be disrupted, and that is also a disadvantage, okay? If the air flowing inside the engine will be disrupted, that is not good for the compressor. The compressor might experience what we call as the compressor stall or surge, which we will further discuss on uh, the succeeding lessons, okay? So those are the disadvantage of that. Another type of inlet would be this one. This is called chin inlet, okay? So this is called chin inlet because it is positioned essentially at the chin part of the airplane, okay? Just like at the bottom of the, of the uh, forward body or the forward fuselage of the airplane. Now, this type of inlet design is mostly suited for uh, military airplanes, okay? And this has a, an advantage of uh, whenever the airplane is flying at a high angle of attack, such as this shown in the picture, the airplane is, for example, let's say climbing, so it is flying at a high angle of attack, then this has the advantage of setting the inlet at the appropriate angle to optimize or to maximize the flow of air going inside the engine. Now we have another one here. This is called fuselage side mounted inlets or otherwise known as side inlets. It's much like the bifurcated inlet. Okay. But the difference between this and the bifurcated inlet is that when you say side inlets or fuselage side mounted inlets, this is normally used if you have twin engines. Okay? Bifurcated inlets are normally used for a single engine only. Okay? But this one is normally used for twin engines. Okay? Um, the main advantage of this is that the duct length can be shortened without adding a significant amount of drag to the aircraft. Okay? But the main disadvantage is that if ever there is some um, uh, air turbulence that enters, that are entering the engine, or let's say some sudden flight maneuvers ex being executed by the airplane, then there is a tendency that there will be an imbalance of the air flowing in both of the inlets, and that could cause a problem on the compressor. Now, a quick check. If you learned something so far with uh, my discussion, I will create a question in the poll and you guys answer this. Okay, did you see? Okay, so there is. I, I published uh, a question. Just a simple assessment if you understand something of what I've uh, talked about lately. So please answer, guys. To have answered already, we're still... We okay, there it is. So everyone answered. So what, what do you think, guys, is the correct answer? Okay, the correct answer is... Oh. Based on the poll, okay, each, each and every one of you has uh, answered differently, okay? But... The correct answer for this is what? The correct answer is letter A for the option one. Okay. Bifurcated is normally for one used for one engine. Side inlets, on the other hand, are normally used if you have two. So that's it for a quick check on you guys. So let's proceed with our discussion.
Now, the next type of inlet we have here is what you call as the subsonic inlets, otherwise known as the pitot inlet or pitot, pitot inlet. Okay. Now, this one is actually the most popular type of inlet, most especially for commercial aircrafts. Okay. And this one, the profile of this inlet is divergent. Okay. When you say divergent, it means the duct that forms your inlet is increasing in diameter from the front going inside. So as you can see in the picture, from the front going inside, it's increasing in diameter. So that, is, that, you, that is what you call as divergent. So the profile of this pitot inlet is divergent. Okay. Now, this has the effect of increasing slightly the pressure of the incoming air from the outside. It is because according to, to some uh, principle, specifically the Bernoulli's principle, okay, if you have a fluid and you accelerate the fluid or you allow the fluid to pass through a diverging passage or a duct, it has or it will have a uh, a tendency to increase in pressure. Okay, so that's why this type of inlet, since it is, this is designed as a diverging passage, the air has a, a tendency to increase in pressure. Now we have now uh, another type of inlet, the turbofan inlet. Now this, uh, the inlet of the turbofan, okay, by the way, the turbofan is a type of gas turbine engine, okay? Now, the inlet of the turbofan is quite unique. Why? Because the inlet, uh, when the air enters here inside the turbofan inlet, okay, it will be separated into two air streams. Okay? One air stream will go inside all throughout the core engine, and another part of the air stream will bypass the core engine. That's why we call we, we sometimes call the turbofan as a bypass engine. That's another term for the turbofan engine. It is because uh, not 100% of the air from the outside completely enters the core engine. Okay? Approximately it's 80%, 20%, okay? 20% approximately of the air that is the one entering the core engine the inside of the engine, and the, the greater portion, 80%, bypasses over here, over here at this portion. Now, this portion of the turbopan inlet here, wherein the air bypasses, is called the bypass duct. We call it the bypass duct. Now, what is the purpose? Why, why, why do we bypass the air in the turbopan inlets? Now, the, the, the purpose, the primary purpose of that bypass air is actually to cool, okay, to cool your core engine. Because we all know the core engine is very hot because of the combustion processes occurring inside. So the, the, by means of air bypassing here at the bypass duct, it has the effect of cooling the air. Uh, uh, cooling the, the core engine. Okay, we have a question here from one of our participants, Sir Andy. He says, what kind of bypass ratio is your turbofan? Okay. So for, uh, for that question, okay, uh, I will not discuss bypass ratio for today. But okay, I, uh, as an advanced information, uh, when you say bypass ratio, it means the ratio of the quantity of air entering the inside of the engine or the core of the engine versus the quantity of the air bypassing or uh, passing here in the bypass duct. So now on the turbofan, okay, we, we generally have three classes of bypass ratios. We have what you call as the low bypass, the medium bypass, and the high bypass. When you say low bypass, it means one is to one ratio. Okay, what is meant by that one is to one ratio? It means the quantity of the air entering the core engine and the one that is bypassing the, the core engine is the same. So it, they are equal, one is to one. Now when you say medium bypass ratio, 
uh, it, it's mostly in the range of 2 is to 1 up to uh, up to 3 is to 1. Okay, 2 is to 1 or 3 is to 1. So that means, for example, 2 is to 1, that means uh, the, the amount of air going here at the bypass stack is twice. Okay, is twice the air that enters here at the core engine. You, uh, we should always remember, guys, that the, the in in the, in those ratios, the the greater number will always be the one that is bypassing. Okay, that the greater number will always be the one that is bypassing the core engine. So the air that flows around here in the bypass duct that is the greater number. And now for the high bypass ratio, that's normally in in the ratio of four is to one or even greater. Okay, so that means four is to one. So that means times four. Okay. The, the, the air that enters here on the bypass duct is four times greater than the air that enters here inside your core engine. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Okay, uh, I forgot something. Uh, aside from cooling the engine, okay, another purpose of this bypass air is to reduce the noise level of your engine. Okay, um, it's uh, why? Because when the air bypass here, so that is a cold air, relatively cold as compared to the air that is inside this engine, okay? When it will ev it eventually mixes with uh, the cold air here, running here in the bypass duct, when it will, when it eventually mixes with the hot air that exits here at the core engine, that has the effect, okay? That has the effect of bringing down the noise level of the engine in particular the exhaust noise okay because you know guys the the the, the sources of the noise in the engine are um, the primary okay the primary sources of noise actually is the, the the gases the exhaust gases that are exiting here at the exhaust section so the the effect of that the the, the cold air that mixes with the hot air that exits over here. The effect of that is to reduce the noise level, most especially the exhaust. Now, let me continue with our discussion. So, more on turbofan inlets. Okay. Now, uh, turbofan inlets ha has actually two types. We have what you call as the short duct design, and we have the full fan duct. So, over here, we have a picture here. This is a real engine. This is called CF680 turbofan engine. This is an example of the short duct design. And over here at the right picture, this is a JT8D turbofan engine. This is now an example of the full fan duct. Now, what, is, what exactly are the difference between the two? So when you say, when you say short duct design, this is mostly used for high bypass engine. And if you, as you can see on the picture, that's why it's called short duct because the ducting, or the, the, we call it the nacelle, the nacelle that covers externally the entire portion of the engine is uh, the cover, as you can see, the duct is from here only up to this portion. This portion over here is actually part of the exhaust already. It's not being covered. That's why it's called short duct design. And you... you 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 mainly uh, you can mainly see this type of design on high bypass engines okay now on the other hand when you say full fan duct as you can see on the picture the entire ducting or the entire nacelle of the engine covers the entire engine from the front from the inlet up to the exhaust there are no portions of the exhaust which are uncovered okay now this is mostly used this is mostly employed on low and medium bypass turbofan engine. And this has some advantage of uh, greater drag, aerodynamic drag reduction, and also noise emission. Why? Because uh, um, since the entire engine is being covered, okay, then this has the effect of minimizing a type of drag which is called the surface drag. Okay, you will learn that more on when uh, you will you study aerodynamics. Okay, but for now, just remember that if you have uh, uh, a smooth surface, 
if the surface are being covered, then it has the effect of minimizing the surface drag, or sometimes also called parasite drag. Okay, and also some level of noise reduction it has. Now, um, I want to have an interaction with you guys. Let's start with Sir Jonathan. I will give you, Sir Jonathan, I will give you some uh, video access right now. Okay, here you are. Very good. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, Sir Kenneth. Okay, how are you today? Good. So far, um, uh, you, do you, uh, can you catch up with our discussion, sir? Yes. Okay. Now, um, I have a short question for you based on our discussion, okay? Is that okay with you? Yes, sir. Okay. So based from what we've studied so far on the types of inlet, um, what do you think is... Or um, what is the, uh, in terms of drag and noise reduction, what do you think among those types of inlets that we've discussed so far, in terms of drag reduction, what do you think is the best type of inlet? In terms of drag reduction. Okay, once again, sir, I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, the short ducting. The Is short it? ducting. So, about this, uh, in terms of drug reduction. Are, are among those short. types of inlets that we have discussed, uh, what do you think has uh, is best in terms of great drug reduction? Okay, I uh, the short inlet duct is uh, uh, can generate less uh, friction or drug compared to a long duct because mm -hmm. of the uh, airflow travel is less compared to a long ducting. In long ducting, uh, airflow travels, meaning the friction of airflow that passes through the surface of the ducting will be greater compared to short ducting. So, therefore, the short ducting uh, is better compared to a uh, long ducting in terms of efficiency, in that uh, ducting efficiency. Okay, but uh, you're talking about the inlet efficiency, right? The efficiency of the ram air that enters the engine. But what about the external drag that is being created uh, on the airplane? What do you think would be the best inlet that would result in the lesser drag being created outside of the airplane? Outside of the airplane. Okay, I think uh, it is the... Uh, smaller inlet. The smaller inlet, okay. like the wa like specifically, please. Like for example, the uh, uh, medium bypass, because the medium bypass has a uh, smaller ducting compared to high bypass. So when it comes to uh, airflow, uh, outside airflow, so I think the medium bypass uh, uh, has a le has a less uh, drag compared to high bypass because the high bypass normally is having a bigger uh, ducting compared to this uh, medium uh, ducting. Okay, very well. Thank you for your uh, inputs, for your answers, Sir Jonathan. Okay, um, I just want to, to, to share something about that. Okay, actually, the 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 uh, when you are thinking, for example, um, think of yourself as the aircraft designer. When you are thinking what would be the best type of inlet design will I apply on my uh, specific type of engine, it will, uh, in terms of drug reduction, it will actually depend on the structure of your airplane. Because the drug being generated by the aircraft is actually dependent upon many factors, one of which is the um, how large or how small or how complicated the overall structure of the airplane is. So that's why the, the drug being generated, one factor of that is the structure of the airplane. So you, you have to depend on the drug being generated by the entire structure of the airplane. That's how you decide on what type of inlet you should uh, use on your uh, engine. Okay, very well, Sir Jonathan. Okay, thank you for this uh, short chat with you. Now, I want to talk with uh, our other participant, Sir Andy. Hello, Sir Andy. I just want a short interaction with you, Sir Andy. 
Okay, um, based from our, um, uh, what we've discussed so far, okay, why it is necessary, okay, uh, based on your opinion, why it is necessary again that uh, the inlet duct or the intake of the engine should be free from any damages or any uh, disturbance, okay? Well, uh, just like uh, what you mentioned on your topic, uh, it is very crucial on the uh, first stage of the uh, part of the engine, which is the inlet, okay. which you also mentioned the different types of inlets, its advantages and disadvantages. Mm -hmm. Since uh, the combustion process, which is the air, uh, gets its uh, percent of uh, air from the inlet. So the flow of the air must be uh, flowless. Uh, I forgot the term that you mentioned, flowless. Which the uh, design of the inlet has a crucial on that particular flow. That's why, uh, because if there's a uh, certain uh, occurrence of um, disturbance on the inlet, just like you mentioned, the performance of the aircraft will, or the engine rather, will greatly affect. There are, there will be number one, uh, I believe you mentioned that, uh, engine stall, right? So that will be the primary factor that the engine should avoid. So the, we need to consider how the inlet must be uh, considerable in terms of the design of the engine. Okay, very well, Sir Andy. Okay. So I agree with that. Okay, that's correct. Okay, so always remember that the inlet of the engine should be maintained as smooth as possible. Okay, it doesn't necessarily mean that there are no allowable damage. We we we, we can uh, we should uh, there is actually allowable limit of damages, but should not. That's why it's allowable. Okay, it should not go beyond that limit. Okay, or else the, the quantity or the quality of the air will be severely affected, and that would create a, a problem uh, to the compressor of the engine. Okay, so thank you very much for the short interaction, Sir Andy. Okay. So let's continue now with our discussion. So let's go to supersonic inlet designs, okay? Now, so far, what we've discussed uh, so far are inlet designs that are most suited for subsonic airplanes. When you say subsonic airplanes, these are the airplanes that are capable of flying below the speed of sound, okay? But... Um, not our airplanes are subsonic, right? We have airplanes that are supersonic. When you say supersonic, these are airplanes that are capable of flying well above the speed of sound. So when the airplane is capable of that supersonic flight, we have now a different uh, inlet designs. Now, let's proceed with our lecture. Now, as I've said, uh, when, when the airplane is capable of flying at extremely high speeds, well above the speed of sound, it's called supersonic, then we need a different design of the inlets. And over here, we have three different types of supersonic inlet designs. We have here what you call as the convergent, divergent, or CD inlet. We also have this movable wedge, variable inlet, or variable geometry inlet. And we have also this movable spike or plug. Okay, so let's discuss this one by one. Now, first, before we proceed on discussing the, the types of supersonic inlets, let's have a brief review of the characteristics of a supersonic flow. Okay? Now, if your, your, your air is uh, flowing 
at a very high speeds, or in this case, supersonic, so that is ab above the speed of sound, it is flowing above the speed of sound. Now, there is, uh, there are characteristics of the air that we need to consider, okay? And the primary characteristics are the velocity and pressure. As you can see here on the picture, if the air flowing at supersonic speeds flows down or accelerate in a convergent passage. Now, this is called convergent, guys. Okay? When the passage or a duct goes from a bigger diameter to a smaller diameter, this is called convergent. The opposite of that is the divergent, okay? I, I've told you already a while ago, the divergent is when it goes from smaller diameter to a large diameter. Now, going back here to what I'm explaining, when the flow is, supersonic flow is going in a convergent passage, what happens is that its velocity will decrease, okay? Or is decreasing and its pressure will increase or in increasing. It's opposite to what happens when it flows into a divergent passage. Okay? Now, in the divergent passage, the velocity now is increasing, but the pressure is decreasing. Okay? Remember those parameters. Remember those changes in characteristics. Okay? It will be useful. Now, now this uh, information here will be useful for you guys to better understand the design of the supersonic ducts. So let's now proceed to the first supersonic inlet ducts, which is called convergent, divergent, or CD inlet. Yeah, that is Bernoulli's theory, correct, Sir Roy. What I've explained about is uh, related to the Bernoulli's theory, yes. <coughs> okay. So proceeding with our discussion, this is the first type of supersonic inlet. This is called convergent, divergent, or CD inlet. As you can see, the design of this inlet is a combination of a convergent and a divergent duct. Okay? So what is the principle of operation of this type of inlet? Now, first things first, remember, remember this. This is important. On every types of inlet designs, the goal, the goal is to decelerate the velocity of the air, okay, in a right velocity before it enters the compressor. Why? Because if the air entering inside the engine is very fast, it's too fast, okay, it will have a tendency to be turbulent. Okay? And that would create a problem on your compressor. Okay? That's why the goal of every inlet design is to decelerate to a correct value of the velocity, the air, before it will strike the compressor on the correct value of velocity, guys. Okay? To prevent problem on our compressor. Now, going back here on this design of the inlet, so... How do we, the question is this, how do we now decelerate the airflow? Assuming that is, it is supersonic, the air, the, air, the air outside here is going supersonic, how do we decelerate it? How do we decelerate it? Now, going back here, let me go back one slide. We need to, what? We need to allow the, the flow of air to go into a converging passage, right? Because if the air flows in the converging, the velocity has a tendency to decrease. That's why going here, you can see this is convergent over here, this first portion of our inlet. So this has the effect of decelerating the velocity of the air. And over here is, as you can see, is the most constricted portion of the inlet. Over here, this is designed to, to create a what you call as the shock wave. Yeah. Converging. Yeah, yeah. The converging portion over here. So as the 
as the air flows here over here at the most constricted portion of the inlet, this portion here is designed to create a shock wave. Now, what is a shock wave? Okay, it will be explained to you guys in, in detail on the M8 basic aerodynamics, but for today, just an advanced information, uh, a shock wave is simply a disturbance, a pressure disturbance being created by a supersonic air flowing. Okay? Now, since the air here going inside the engine is very fast, going supersonic, it will automatically create a pressure disturbance over here, and that is what we call as the shock wave. Now, this shock wave now, once it is formed over here, this has a tendency of further decelerating the velocity of the air okay now from supersonic here in this convergent portion when after it passes through this shock wave now the 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 velocity now will become subsonic already okay so the velocity now is below the speed of sound subsonic now from the subsonic airflow theory we further decelerate okay we, we can further decelerate the velocity of the airflow when it is subsonic by allowing it to pass on a diverging portion of the duct that's why over here on this portion this is diverging already okay when you when when the subsonic air passes through a diverging section it has a tendency to decelerate or decrease in velocity velocity okay so, the velocity now at this point is just at the right amount, okay? And then it will enter the compressor, no problem, okay? The compressor can handle the velocity of the air, okay? So, that's, that's the principle of operation of this CD inlet. So, once again, I always keep in mind that the objective of the, the inlet is to decelerate the incoming air at the right velocity to prevent a problem on our compressor because if the air velocity is too fast the compressor cannot handle it we will have a problem on the compressor okay it might create stall okay so that's why the goal once again is to decelerate and how do you decelerate a supersonic airflow you need to pass it you need to allow the airflow to pass on a combination of a converging portion and a diverging portion okay Now let's proceed. Another type of inlet we have here, which is used for supersonic aircraft, is what you call as the variable geometry inlets. Now this type of inlet has a movable wedge inside. Okay. And that movable wedge uh, can extend and retract depends on the uh, velocity of the airplane, whether it is moving subsonic or supersonic. Now, the purpose of that wedge is to create a temporary convergent-divergent passage inside your inlet. Now, this is how it looks like. Now, I'll explain to you the principle of operation of this variable geometry inlet. First, look at this. We have here two conditions. We have subsonic condition and supersonic condition. Now, imagine the airplane is flying at subsonic condition. So, once again, subsonic meaning less than the speed of sound okay now when the airplane is flying at subsonic condition the configuration of the inlet looks like this you see this is the wedge over here the wedge is retracted upward okay so now the throat area over here is greatly increased and you have a very uh, large passage of the air inside so the air can just pass Okay, and over here, you can see we have two valves that are open. First, we have here what you call as the dump valve. This is open to increase airflow to the engine, to allow more airflow that comes into the engine. But over here, um, nearing the compressor, nearing the first stage of the compressor, we have another valve that is open. This is called spill valve. Okay, this has the purpose of expelling some air okay to prevent turbulence on the air that will enter the compressor okay so the the dump valve is open to 
allow an extra scoop of air to enter inside the engine and we have a spill valve that is open here to remove okay so you essentially uh, allow an extra air to enter inside but over here before the first stage of the compressor you open a spill valve here to vent out excessive air the purpose is to prevent turbulence so this is the condition of the inlet when the airplane is flying subsonically okay so we have a question here where is the wedge valve um <coughs> sorry what do you mean sir roy by the wedge valve can you please clarify Do you mean the, do you mean the, okay, the wedge lever, okay. So the wedge lever is over here. This portion, as you can see, this is the wedge, and this is being lowered down, extended or retracted by this actuator. So this is the actuator. This is the lever that moves this wedge down or up. Okay. Okay. Very well. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now, uh, continuing with the discussion. Now, let's go to supersonic condition. Once the airplane now is flying supersonically, what will happen is this. The wedge now will be extended by this actuator. So, the wedge will be extended like that downward. And as you can see, what happens with our passage or with our intake duct? You now have a combination of convergent portion and a divergent portion, right? As you can see on the picture, we have a convergent portion over here and a diverging portion over here. So just like, just like this one. So if you can think of it, we are creating a temporary convergent divergent inlet. Okay, on that kind of uh, inlet, on variable geometry. By allowing this wedge to retract downward, you are creating a temporary convergent-divergent passage. Okay, so the same, what happens? So once again, uh, supersonic air outside will flow or will pass through a converging section. What will happen? It, ha it will, ha uh, it, it will uh, decelerate or decrease in velocity plus the fact that this inlet is designed to uh, create a series of shock waves over here. Okay, uh, pressure disturbances. These shock waves will further or will help in decelerating the airflow. And over here at the most constricted portion of the duct, over here, you will have a sonic velocity over here approximately. When you say sonic velocity, the, the airflow now will be exact equal to the speed of sound so uh, the airflow now is beginning to decelerate okay so the sonic velocity over here and now how 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 do you further uh, decelerate the sonic velocity by allowing it to pass in a diverging portion that's why over here over here is diverging portion already now once again we have two valves that are open we have the dump valve and spill valve both open but if you can notice on a different position as compared to when your airplane is flying at subsonic condition. So the dump valve and spill valve are both open on that manner to vent excessive airflow. Because since the airplane is flying very fast, the, 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 um, the amount of air that enters inside is very huge. Okay? You have a huge amount of air that enters inside. So to prevent excessive turbulence of the air, and to prevent a problem on the compressor, these, bow, these valves here, both the dump valve and spill valve, are both open for the purpose of uh, venting excessive airflow. Okay. So continuing with our discussion, so the last type of supersonic inlet design is what we call as the movable spike or plug or sometimes called inlet cone. Now, this one, this type of supersonic inlet is normally used for sustained supersonic flight, meaning for longer periods of supersonic flight. Now, you see, guys, 
this type of inlet, I forgot to, to, to mention, okay? This type of inlet, this variable geometry and also this one, convergent divergent inlets, these are inlets which are only suitable for use in short bursts of supersonic flights only. Meaning, let's say for example, for a few minutes only. And after that, the airplane will have to decelerate at subsonic speeds. But if your airplane needs to fly at a longer periods of time, flying very fast at supersonic, then the most appropriate uh, design of inlet to be used is this one. This is called the inlet code. Now, what is the principle of operation of this inlet code? Now, once again, always remember, okay, I will once again reiterate, the main objective is for the airflow to ultimately decelerate at the right velocity before it will enter the compressor to prevent problem on the compressor, okay? Always remember that. Now, how does the inlet cone do that? How does it decelerate the airflow? Now, this inlet cone is designed to create a series of shock waves. It's to be specific, these are uh, designed to create what you call as the oblique shock waves. When you say oblique shock waves, the, the, the shock waves are created at an oblique angle. Okay? Oblique angle with reference to the surface of the cone. Okay? Now, so as the shock waves, as these oblique shock waves form here, okay? So once again, it ha as the airflow passes through those series of shock waves, it will eventually decelerate the airflow. And that's just the oblique shock waves over here. Or as you can see here on the inlet portion, this is designed to create a normal shock wave. This is another type of shock wave. It's normal. When you say normal shock wave, it is uh, a shock wave that is created perpendicular, 90 degrees. Okay, that's why it's called normal. 90 degrees with respect to the surface of the cone. So you have two kinds of shock waves being formed here, guys. Okay, we have a, a oblique shock waves created at an oblique angle and a normal shock wave created at a right angle. So all of these shock waves are, are, are helping, okay, to reduce the velocity of the supersonic air so once it passes all those series of shock waves and when it enters here the flow now is subsonic at the right amount of velocity for the compressor okay so that's the principle of operation of this inlet cone now as an addition to this uh, this inlet cone has basically two configuration one configuration is you have a fixed inlet cone, meaning this cone here is not moving. It's fixed at a certain position. The other configuration is the movable inlet cone. Okay. Uh, when you say movable, so of course this inlet cone can move forward or move backward. Now, specifically, it will move forward or outward as the airplane flies faster. And vice versa, as the airplane decelerates, it will goes, uh, it will go backward or in its default position. Okay, so always remember that. I will repeat: if the configuration of the inlet cone is movable, as the airplane flies faster, this inlet cone will have to move outward. And vice versa, if it decelerates, it will go back to its default position. Now, why why does it need to move forward? Because this in, uh, as this moves forward or outward, more and more oblique shock waves will form on the surface of the inlet cone. That's the tendency. As the aircraft flies and flies faster, reaching supersonic speed, and as this inlet cone goes outward like that, more and more oblique shock waves will be created over here at the surface of inlet cone. And the more shock waves being created, the more... Uh, the more it will decelerate, okay, the flow of air entering the engine. Okay, guys, so that's it for the explanation of the inlet cone. So, I'll, uh, once again, just, uh, I, I will create a poll, guys, to assess if you somehow understand what we, uh, what we are talking about, what we talk about so far, okay? Please stand by. I will create a question. 
Okay? So there it is. Kindly answer, guys. So what is the supersonic inlet design that is most suited for sustained supersonic flight? So what do you think is the best answer or is there a correct answer for this? Okay, we're waiting for just one answer. There's only one remaining. Okay, so everybody has answered. So each and every one of you, once again, just like the, the first poll, each and every one of you has a different answer. Okay, but the correct answer, guys, what do you think? The correct answer is inlet cone, option three or letter C. Okay, that is the most suited design, type of supersonic inlet design that is most suited for sustained supersonic flight, meaning for longer hours of supersonic flight. This is the most recommended type of design. Yes, this is also called plug inlet. Okay, so continuing with our discussion. So another type of inlet over here is what you call as the bell mouth inlet. Okay. So this, this uh, type of inlet is normally used for helicopters, okay? Uh, it's not well suited for um, fixed-wing airplanes, okay? Mainly because it has a great deal of drag. It creates a great deal of drag. Why? Because as you can see, the shape of this inlet is not aerodynamically clean. Okay, there, there is a, as you can see, the, in, the intake nose is very large in its uh, frontal area. It's very dominant in its frontal area. That's why it's obvious that the drug, the parasite drug being created by this is very large. That's why it's not mostly ideal to be used on uh, most fixed wing airplanes. You can only find this, once again, you can only find this on some helicopters, not all. It's just some helicopters and uh, as well as those engines that are being tested on the test cell okay you see when when for example um, the uh, Rolls-Royce everybody of you are, are aware of the company Rolls-Royce that is the uh, uh, a very big manufacturer of engine being used on commercial airplanes so let's say, for example, Rolls-Royce designed a certain engine. Now, um, one of, before it's actually certified, okay, the engine has to be tested a couple of times, okay? And they use this, what you call as the test cell, okay? Something like a, a laboratory equipment, they will put the engine there and they will run the engine to see and to test whether it performs on its desired parameters or operating uh, uh, limits or not, okay? Now, during those process, okay, normally they equip bell mouth inlets, okay? They, they, uh, they, they install a removable bell mouth inlet. Why? Because this bell mouth inlet, actually the, the major advantage of this inlet is that among other inlets that we discussed, this has the best uh, when it comes to um, allowing a smooth flow of air, a good quality, turbulent free of turbulent free air that can enter the engine. So during engine testing, it's important that you have a very good quality of air, a very uniform turbulent free. Uh, flow of air that enters the engine for your engine to perform optimally and to obtain its uh, design parameters. Okay, that's why they, they use this mostly on testing. But uh, as I've said a while ago, because it's it's disadvantage actually at outweighs its advantage. Okay, the disadvantage as I've said is a, it it has a greater drag it outweighs its advantage. That's why, that's the major reason why this is not mostly commonly seen on fixed-wing airplanes. Yes. 
engine test bay, you can call it that way, engine test cell. Sometimes you can also hear the term engine test stand. It's the same, sir. Okay. So continuing with our discussion. Now, this is another type of inlet. This is called blow-in doors. Now, this is a special type of inlet. Not all airplanes have this kind of inlet. As far as I know, currently, only this airplane, as you can see on the figure, only that airplane has this. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Two. We have two airplanes in existence today that has this, that has that kind of inlet. This one on the picture is uh, a UAV-8D Harrier jet by the U.S. Navy. And uh, another one I know is the Tupolev. Uh, Tupolev. Uh, that's an aircraft from Russia. Okay, by the way, so what is this blow-in doors? This is, as you can see, this is something like an extra inlet positioned at the side of the engine near the major inlet over here. Now, what is the purpose of this blow-in door? This is mostly um, used to supply extra amount of air going directly to your compressor during high power operations while the aircraft is on the ground. For example, this airplane is uh, performing an engine ground run. Okay, EGR on the ground and it's, it's performing high power EGR. Now, this airplane, uh, since as you can see, the inlet is very narrow, okay, in order for your airplane to achieve a high power setting, you need a huge amount of air to enter the engine. And that's actually a problem when you're performing a, uh, an EGR on the ground because on the ground, you have no forward velocity. Your airplane is just standing on the ground. so. So, the air is very limited, okay? So, that's why on this type of airplane, to allow high power operations on the ground, to allow more air to enter the engine, there is an extra inlets. These are extra inlets that allow or supplement additional air to enter directly the compressor, okay? Okay, uh, we have an input here from our participants. Sir Roy says, carriers require high power for takeoff since they are aircraft carrier based and have short takeoff. Yes, that's correct also. Okay, so I, I, I will actually say that. Okay, yeah, you just... Um, I, I will actually say it, actually. Okay, uh, aside from that, okay, uh, aside from high power operations on the ground, this helps in um, in um, in developing high power for um, short takeoffs and vertical takeoff. The, the Harrier jets are actually capable of vertical takeoff, right? Because the the nozzle of this engine can be rotated downward, so it can it's capable of uh, vertical takeoff and landing. So during those situations, the, uh, the, the airplane needs or the engine needs a very high power. That's why uh, this inlet does that. Okay, It supplies additional air directly to the compressor to provide high power for the engine. Yeah. VTOL and STOL. Yes, correct. VTOL stands for vertical takeoff and landing. STOL stands for short takeoff and landing. Okay. Yeah, and during those situations, once again, I will repeat, during those situations, you need a very high amount of power being developed by your engine. That's why this uh, this aircraft has this blow-in doors, which serves as an extra inlet that will allow supplementary air to enter your compressor to support high power operations. Okay, that's the principle of this blow-in door. Now, continuing with our discussion, we have here turboprop inlets. So, we have here the three types of configuration, three types of inlet configuration being used for turboprop aircrafts. By the way, when you say turboprop aircrafts, it's short for turbopropeller 
uh, turbo propeller. It means it's it's a gas turbine engine airplane with a propeller. Okay, it has a propeller. So as you can see, the inlet is basically designed close to the propeller spinner. We have here, this is called a ducted spinner inlet. Uh, this design uh, consists of this something like a spinner fairing which is connected to the to the uh, to the uh, propeller spinner and the air will enter over here okay and over here we have a conical spinner inlet we have a short uh, fairing like that and the air will enter that way okay and this one is slightly different this is called under scoop inlet okay the inlet is over here at the bottom okay so the air will enter here under the propeller that's the under scoop inlet okay so different configurations for turboprop inlets now so those are the different kinds of turbine engine inlets we are now finished with discussing uh, different types of turbine engine inlets now, um, I will have, uh, I would want uh, an, another interaction once again with you guys, the participants. Sir Jonathan, how are you today in our class? So, by the way, um, I would want to ask you something about what we've discussed so far, okay? Now, based on um, the... Uh, So once again, um, what is the, uh, do you, you remember we discussed the chin inlet? You remember that? Uh, that? That's a type of inlet, the chin inlet. So once again, what, what is the advantage of that chin inlet? Can you uh, discuss it to me? What is the advantage of that chin inlet? Chin inlet, that is a What's the switch? Oh, the chin inlet is like this. Wait. Over here. That's the chin inlet. It's it's situated at the chin or at the bottom of the fuselage and the chin area of the airplane. Now, my question once again for you is that what do you think is the advantage of that design? I've discussed that a while ago. What is the major advantage of the chin uh, inlet? <clears throat> uh, the major advantage for this uh, chin inlet is that uh, uh, air disturbance is less compared to uh, having a inlet on side of the fuselage for okay. a fighter plane aircraft because uh, once during maneuvering for a uh, uh, two inlet dump on each side of the fuselage disturbance will be more uh, higher because of the fuselage is in between. Mm -hmm. So while if it is under, so once the aircraft maneuver left and right, uh, the, the disturbance will be less compared to to ducting. That's uh, my Okay, so that's your uh, opinion. Okay, uh, that's your answer for that. Okay, very well. But uh, actually, um, the, 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 I think the appropriate answer for that, or the, the, the correct answer for that is that its, its major advantage would be if the airplane is climbing, for example, at extremely high angle of attack, it has the advantage of positioning, the, as you can see, the, the, uh, when the airplane is flying like that, the high angle of attack. And you have an inlet over here at the chin, so it is 
in an optimal position for the air to enter. So it 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 somehow optimizes the airflow or it maximizes the airflow that enters because it is perfectly aligned in accordance with the angle of incidence or angle of attack of the airplane. So that's the one major advantage of that. Okay, thank you very much. Very well, Sir Jonathan. Let's go to Sir Andy. Um, I just want to interact with you, Sir. Um, I have uh, some questions for you, if you can uh, catch up. So once again, what happens, if you can remember on our discussion a while ago, what is the characteristic of a supersonic airflow when it enters a converging passage okay what happens to the supersonic airflow when it enters the converging passage on the convergent process yeah on a convergent what what convergent happens? passage yes well uh as far as i remember you mentioned the convergent divergent design of your inlet now specifically uh, on the convergent side, right? If you're asking, what is the... Uh, say it again. Okay. I'll repeat the question. Uh, um, what happens, okay? What happens to the supersonic airflow? What happens to its characteristic when it flows through a convergent portion or convergent duct? Well, of course... Uh, the velocity is still there. No? The, velocity, yes. the velocity is high. Okay. And then, uh, sure? yeah, convergent. Convergent? Yes. yes. Convergent. And then, convergent, and then it, it now goes to your divergent. There's your, uh, what you call this, uh, will cause the, uh, I forgot the term. Uh, between uh, that, the okay, okay, I, I will help you with my question. Okay, um, what okay. happens specifically to the velocity and pressure? Yes, it creates shock waves between the convergent. Uh, thank you, Sir Roy. Thank you. Uh, between the convergent divergent, the process of that, uh, on a supersonic speed. Upon it enters the curve of divergent, it creates shock wave that will decelerate as you as your uh, term uh, as you term the use decelerate the airflow going to the intake, which it will uh, uh, give a uh, effective flow of air going to the compression. Okay. Uh, very well. I hope you didn't. I hope you didn't see the chat from Sir Roy because he gave the answer already. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, thank that, you for that. Very that, well. Yes. That that was the that was the that was the essence of the convergent divergent from the Bernoulli's principle. As the velocity increases, pressure decreases. Now, once it enters the divergent uh, part of your uh, what you call this intake, then your velocity decreases and your, eventually your pressure increases. That is uh, derived from the Bernoulli's principle. And it will give a very effective uh, airflow for your compression. Okay, okay, okay. Very well, very well. Thank you for that, Sir Andy. Thank you. Thank you. Too. Now, um, going on with our discussion, we only have a few minutes left. Okay. Uh, there. Okay, there was a raised hand here. I'm sorry, I, I didn't notice it a while ago. There was a raised hand here, which was um, a question raised by uh, Jonathan. How does bypass engine reduce noise? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. I, I didn't notice the symbol. I'm sorry for that. Well, um, how does bypass engine reduce noise? As I've said, uh, we have a couple of methods, but uh, one of which is uh, because of the bypass air that flows into the bypass duct. 
the fact that the cool air mixes with the hot air that has the effect of reducing the exhaust level of noise. Apart from that, we have uh, the, the engines are mostly uh, equipped with different types of noise suppressors. But sorry, Sir Joe, uh, I couldn't discuss it right now because it's uh, beyond the scope of our discussion. So please stand by for that. So we are now on this part. We have a foreign object damage. So the inlet, okay, as I've said a while ago, um, is um, very important for the inlet to be free from any damages, to be free from any um, obstructions. And one major causes of cause of damage and obstruction to the inlet is of course the FODs or the foreign object damage. When you when when you when you say FODs, this refers to any objects or anything that can be sucked in right away inside the engine and will eventually cause damage to the different components of the engine. It will damage the fan, it will damage the inlet duct, the compressor, and many others. Okay, so it's really very dangerous the tendency for your engine to have a foreign object being ingested in. That's why the engines are normally designed to have or to incorporate some methods to prevent this from happening. To prevent foreign object ingestion on the engine. Now, we have here the three common methods that we normally use to prevent or minimize FOD. We have the installation of the inlet screen. We have uh, the use of the inlet filter or separators, and uh, on some engines also uses this what you call as the vortex dissipators. Okay, this is the inlet screen. Okay, this is a very basic, uh, uh, a protective something like a protective cover. Okay, that's being put in in the inlet of the engine, and this is actually a standard operating procedure for the maintenance of the airplane. Whenever the aircraft is to be grounded for a long periods of time, okay, because the probability that there will be a foreign object that will enter here is high, right? If the airplane is to be allowed on the ground for uh, an extended periods of time, okay? So, in cases of that, okay, it is recommended that we put some cover on the inlet, okay? Another thing to prevent foreign object ingestion on the engine is the use of this filter separator. Now, this is normally incorporated on turbo propeller airplanes. Now, what is the principle of this filter separator? The principle of this is that there is a wedge that can be retracted down and upward like that. Something like a, a wedge or a deflector vane to be specific. This is called deflector vane. Okay? You see, this is the this is an underscoop inlet, okay? And along this inlet, on the inside, there is a vein that can be deflected out, uh, downward like that. Now, the principle is this. If this vein is deflected downward like that, you can see here that there is a converging passage over here. Now, this creates what you call as a venturi effect. What is this venturi effect? It is uh, the effect that the, the 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 air pressure is dropping on a certain region, mostly on the uh, on the most constricted portion or on the smallest area of the duct. There is a drop in pressure as the air flows in that, and that creates this venturi effect that we call. Now, this venturi effect. has a tendency to um, allow the air to go that way inside the engine. So over here, this is the engine at above. So the, the air has a tendency to turn upward like that because of that venturi effect being created here on this region. Now, only the pure air meaning the air that is free from contaminants can execute that curve like that, upward. If the air has contaminants, for example, some sand particles or stone, okay, those contaminants cannot execute 
an upward turn like that. It Those contaminants has a tendency only to go this way in this direction. And these contaminants will just be thrown overboard, meaning outside the engine. Why is that so? It is because of the principle of inertia. Okay? Let's go back a little bit on the principle of inertia in physics. Every object has inertia. And inertia is related actually to the weight of the object. Now, going back here, the weight of the pure air is lesser than the weight of these contaminants. Okay? So, therefore, the, the air has lesser inertia. And since the air has a lesser inertia, it has now uh, a much more capable or uh, it has now much more cap uh, it's much more capable of executing a, a, an upward turn like that going inside the engine. Unlike the, the contaminants which has larger weight than the air and therefore has a large inertia since it has a large inertia when it came over here, when it comes on this location, it cannot go that way. It cannot execute an upward turn that way. So the tendency for these contaminants is just to go straightly over here and be dumped overboard. And that's the principle of this filter separator. So once again, as a summary, by, by allowing this deflector vane to extend downward like that, you will create a venturi effect on this portion and that venturi effect will allow this airflow specifically the pure air to execute a curve upward curve uh, path entering the engine and the tendency for the contaminants since they have a much larger inertia they cannot go that way they only have a tendency to go this way and be dumped overboard outside the engine so that's how you prevent foreign object from being ingested in turbo propeller airplanes okay by the use of this filter separator now on turbo shop we also have a filter separator so this is how it looks like it's mostly the same principle like the turbo prop filter separator you can see here the inlet section over here on this location this is where the venturi effect is being created at this most constricted portion. So once again, if there is a venturi effect over here, the low pressure <coughs> being created on that portion, so it has the effect of allowing the, the clean air to execute our, a sharp curve like that going to the engine. So this part here is going to the engine. But... The contaminants, since it is much heavier, having a large inertia, it cannot execute a sharp curve to the right like that, going inside the engine. It only has a tendency to go directly here and inside this sediment trap. This is something like a bug, a collection bug, wherein all of the sediments, all of the contaminants of there will, ha will be collected over here. Okay? So that's how you prevent foreign object ingestion for turbo shaft. So once again, by the use of the Venturi effect, only the pure air can execute a turn, a sharp right turn over here going into the engine. And the contaminants, it only has a tendency to just go here to the sediment trap. It cannot execute a turn here going into, into the engine because of its large inertia. Okay, so much like in, much like, similar in principle to the turbo propeller filter separator both designs incorporate a constricted portion or a, a a a smaller area of the inlet duct to create this venturi effect okay now Let's go to another one. This is called vortex dissipators. Now, what is this vortex dissipators? The concept here is that on the um, on the downward portion of the engine, there is 
uh, some uh, there is a nozzle here that is directed downward and that blows a high pressure stream of air downward on the surface now what is the effect of that by blowing uh, a high pressure air downward at this surface that uh, has the effect of destroying the vortex or in other words the low pressure area that is being created here at the bottom surface of the engine now why it is important that we destroy the low pressure area or the vortex at the bottom of this engine you see <coughs> when the airplane is on the ground and the engine is running mostly there is a vortex flowing here or being created here and that has a tendency that because of the vortex being created here on the ground that has a tendency to suck any objects that are placed here for example there is a mechanic working near the engine and he just left some tool over here because of the vortex forming here the, the tool can actually or has a tendency actually to be sucked inside the engine when the engine is running even at idle power or at low power setting that's why it's important when the airplane is on the ground to destroy the the tendency of the vortex to form here and we do that by allowing uh, uh or by blowing some high pressure air high pressure air to the surface now that high pressure air comes from the compressor of the engine okay there is some uh, short nozzle being directed here and it gets high pressure inside the engine specifically from the compressor and it blows downward like that okay to destroy vortex to prevent any foreign object around here at the surface to be ingested inside the engine now how does this being activated now we have uh, normally it depends on design but it can be manually activated on some designs there is a push button that can be pushed by the pilot to activate the system on some there this is being automatically activated okay the the uh, the system has two logics okay one logic is that uh, the airplane should be completely on the ground so the the, uh, the the sensors on the landing gear should sense all the weight of the airplane being concentrated on the ground that's the the one logic and the other logic of the system is that the engine should be running at least idle power so if those two logics are being satisfied then this will automatically operate okay now uh, not all airplanes um, have this vortex dissipator but one example of airplane that has this i can give you is a, a boeing 737-200 version but not all actually not all 737-200 only those that are required by operator because this is actually um, optional item only those aircraft operators or airliners that operate in a dirty environment for example in sahara desert probably wherein there is a greater tendency for contaminants to enter the engine only those operators that operate in a dirty environment uh, equip their airplanes with this vortex dissipator okay one example is the boeing 737-200 